We're wrestling with the challenging uh, but the important text of James 2, 14 to 26. And the apparent or seeming uh, claim that James contradicts Paul. And the first way we're going to try to solve this problem or to think about this passage is to approach it grammatically. And we don't say simply, it's all Greek to me, and then move on. Even if we can't do this ourselves, hopefully we can. That's why we emphasize the knowledge of the original language and its importance in interpretation. Even if we can't do all of this ourselves, we nevertheless have to have a part of it in our exegetical process. We need to surround ourselves not just with a with a cloud of witnesses, with a good cloud of witnesses. In this case, with those witnesses, namely those secondary resources who can explain to us the potential significance of the Greek text. And my hope, again, is that even if you can't do this, that you'll recognize how valuable it is. And so then when some Greek like me, Greek geek like me comes along and offers to you some suggestions or ideas, that you'll, well, pay attention, right? That you won't just dismiss this as something that's irrelevant or just esoteric or something that's only minutia that only some egghead professor would be concerned with, but that you also recognize how important it is to the interpretation process. Now, as it turns out, actually there are a number of ways in which the knowledge of the Greek text in this passage is quite helpful. That's not true for every passage. I mean, well, Every passage has some benefit from looking at it in the original text, right? But some have more than others. And this is an example where actually there are quite a few ways to illustrate the things that we can benefit from or learn from by looking at the text in this case in the original Greek language. So the first example comes from, I'm treating them in order as they appear in the text, in 14a. So right out of the gate, Paul uses a phrase, t ta aphelos, t ta aphelos. Now, if you did a, a word study of this phrase, you would see that it occurs quite often, not just in Scripture, but outside of Scripture, too. It was a kind of fixed phrase or stereotyped phrase. And not only would you find that it's a fixed or stereotyped phrase, you would see that it involves a rhetorical question. That is, not a legitimate question, but more of an assertion. Because whenever somebody said t to aphelos, which could be translated, what is the benefit or what is the use, what is the gain, the answer is always the same. And the answer is nothing. Squat. Nada. And so when James begins his passage by saying t to aphelos, well, whatever comes next is probably going to be something negative, something that isn't true, where there is no gain or benefit. Another example has to do with the way that um, the second half of the verse is described. Actually in Greek, and it's sometimes translated this way, simply in Greek, can faith save him? Now if somebody came to you uh, abstract and said, you know, can faith save you? And your natural reaction, of course, would be yes, of course faith can save us. But in the Greek text, there's the definite article before the word faith. So in other words, the Greek text says, can the faith save him. And when James says the faith, he doesn't mean again faith in general, faith in the abstract. He means a special kind of faith, namely the kind of faith that I just finished describing in the first half of the verse. And what did he just describe in the first half of the verse? He says, well, if somebody says they have faith but have no works, right? And then he says, can, and in English we might say, can that faith or can such faith as I just described to you save him? And so the translation in, uh, I think it's the NIV, such faith is a good one because it shows that he's not talking about faith in general or the ideal or the abstract. He's talking about a specific faith, a more narrow faith, the kind of faith he just mentioned in 14a. And then you have to add to that um, another point, and that is um, that phrase, the faith, referring back to the first half of 14a, is found in a question. And in Greek, there are three ways to ask a question. You can ask a question in a neutral way. I could say, are you enjoying this uh, teaching video? And I just asked it in a neutral way in which I, I don't know. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. However, what if I said, um, you're not enjoying this teaching video, are you? Well, then I'm asking more a rhetorical question, not a real question, but I'm more asserting that you're not enjoying this. Or I could say, you're enjoying this video, aren't you? 
And again, that's a more of a rhetorical question, expecting the answer yes. So in Greek, you can do it the neutral way, or you can do it the rhetorical way, where you clearly show what you expect the answer to be. And here in this verse, 14b, right, there is a question, and the answer is clearly no. In other words, James says, can such faith, namely the faith that I just described in 14a, where a person says they have faith and has no works, can that faith save him? And he says in an assertive kind of way, no, it cannot. And so the English translation, you can't get that from, but the Greek clearly shows that James isn't asking something, he's asserting something. And it's certainly something important because it's the opening verse. It's kind of setting the thesis for the first half of what he's going to talk about in the pericope or passage. Here's another example. Uh, verse 15 literally begins in Greek with, if a brother or sister. Now, if sentences uh, have a special name. They're called conditional sentences, conditional sentences. And there are three kinds in Greek, a first class condition, a second class, and a third class. And they all have different nuances or emphasis. And this one here is a third class condition. Now, some scholars, I, I'm sorry, there's a bit of debate or confusion among scholars on this, let alone for maybe students trying to understand the Greek language, but some scholars take the third class condition as introducing only a hypothetical situation. And you can see that reflected in the NIV where it says, suppose a brother or a sister, right? So in other words, uh, James apparently, according to this translation or interpretation, James isn't describing a real situation, an actual problem. No, he's in a somewhat hypothetical way saying, no, let's just imagine for the sake of argument this is happening. All right. Now, I want to suggest you already now, I'm going to come back to this later under our historical uh, analysis. I want to suggest to you that actually this third class condition is better describing, or better understood as describing, not a hypothetical situation, but a general situation, or a common or widely experienced situation. In other words, I want to, I want to suggest to you that what James is uh, holding out for his readers here is not something that's only imaginary or hypothetical, but actually something that's way too common, something that's happening in a far too general way among their churches. In other words, there are way too many illustrations or examples of brothers or sisters not having enough clothes and food running around and the church is not ministering to them. So we'll come back to this later under historical, but again, um, you can see how your translators aren't just translating, they're interpreting for you. Because they didn't translate it if, they translated it as suppose. So they've already made a decision on how you ought to understand the third class condition. Also in that verse is the phrase, suppose a brother or sister. Now, more and more modern or contemporary translations are following the practice of being gender inclusive. And I think there's something good about that, and you can certainly defend that practice. But here's an instance where if you had a Bible like that, you would miss something that James is doing. In other words, the biblical texts typically just have brother. And then you wouldn't know that in your English Bible because, again, from a gender-inclusive Bible translation would take the word brother and translate it as brother and sister. And therefore you would miss what James does here. He explicitly mentions in Greek not just a brother but also a sister. And so you might not catch that actually is somewhat significant here or somewhat unusual or rare. Or to say it differently, um, James wants to highlight that it's not just male members of the church that are in need and being neglected, but apparently female members are too. And by the way, I think this strengthens my case that James is not describing a hypothetical situation, right? If, if you're just doing an imaginary situation, you could just say, well, suppose a person is doing it. No, by mentioning not just brothers, male members, but also sisters, female members, it sounds like he's describing a more real or actual situation. Now here's a little more of a nuance point from the Greek language. So within verse 15, there's a participle in which describe these brothers or sisters as, quote, lacking, right? They're lacking daily food and so forth. And the fact that it's in the present tense, if you know Greek, time only matters in the indicative mood. So this is not an indicative verb. This is a participle. 
So the fact that it's in the present tense has nothing to do with them lacking food in the present as opposed to the past or the future. No, the present tense here has nothing to do with time, but what we call typically verbal aspect. It says something about the nature or the character of the action. And the present tense participle is rarer, and thereby it's more emphatic. The biblical writer will typically use the present tense if you want to highlight the ongoing or continuous nature of the action. And so that stresses, it seems to me, that when we read a brother or sister lacking, now in the present tense, that, that suggests that that's a fairly serious situation. It's not a rare or unusual or an isolated one-time event, but this was an ongoing, again, a more general, uh, a common experience. In verse 16, we have two commands, and um, I can't translate them because as soon as I translate them, I also interpret them. But the point I want to make now is these two commands could be seen as either being in the middle voice or the passive voice. The forms are exactly the same, so either one is possible. So the middle voice is the voice used when the speaker does the action, and the passive voice is when the Sorry, I didn't say that right. The middle voice is when the subject uh, does the action. The subject does the action. And the passive is when the subject is acted upon, right? Receives the action. That's the difference. So you can see the example, the, the, the active voice, and that's closer to the middle, the mouse ate the cat. Or in the middle, technically, it would be the mouse ate for himself or for his own benefit, the cat. But the passive is now the mouse isn't doing anything but is being acted upon. The mouse was eaten by the cat. Now, all that to say is we could then translate these two commands as either middle, warm yourselves and feed yourselves. That's one way to read it. Or you could read it passively. In other words, this isn't something that you have to do to yourself, but some outside person or force will do it, right? So then it would be be warmed and be fed. And um, I raise this because if it were middle, uh, we, we don't know for sure which one it is, it could be. If it were middle, that would be even more of a callous response of the church. So this would be the idea that if you see somebody in need, instead of saying, be warmed and be fed, the idea that somebody other than this person will help you with that, maybe you or God or something like that. But if you do it middle, what you're saying is, you person who are in need, you need to do this to yourself, right? You've got to kind of do something to yourself. And so it reflects, uh, uh, again, a more callous uh, unchristian, unloving response of the church to people who are in need. Ralph Martin is a, a retired professor from Fuller Theological Seminary, and he says probably the middle, remember it could be middle or passive, probably the middle is better here for both verbs, though either voice points to the fact that some professed believers are failing to meet the needs of other church members. So he's siding in the interpretation that I've given to you, but he also concedes that, you know, either way, uh, the church comes off as being guilty, failing to minister to needy brothers and sisters. Verse 19 has a verb that is worthy of some attention. We read about the demons, even the demons believe that God is one, and they shudder. Now this Greek word thriso is a hapax legomenon, which is just a fancy Greek way of saying it's a word that occurs only one time. And so in order to know this, what this word means, we can't go to other passages in the New Testament. We have to go outside the Bible to see what it means. And when we do that, we see that it is often used of people when they're intensely scared, so that you know their hair stands up on end, or of animals, right, who in a state of fear or defense bristle. And this says to me that, because when I hear the English word shudder, and I know from experience that everybody hears that the same way, but when I hear the word shudder, that's a somewhat modest or mild reaction. I mean, I, I recognize that it's not a positive one, right, it's an uncomfortableness, but but the Greek reminds me that uh, this reaction of the demons is more strong than that, right? It's a sense of, ah, right? a sense of deep fear or uh, terror. And so that's the point that I think uh, ought to be heard when we read about the demons and the kind of, quote, faith they have in their knowledge that God exists. And we'll come back to that a little later on in subsequent presentations.
In verse 20b, uh, there is probably a pun. Now, puns, of course, uh, you need to know the original language to catch the pun. So, for instance, on this sign, it says in English, frog parking only, all others will be toad. And the only way to get this pun is to know that, wait a minute, toad is another name for a frog, but also toad refers to being towed. It's the past tense of towing a vehicle. Now, first of all, let's show what the pun is in the text, and then we'll talk about why you might engage in a pun. What does the speaker gain by making use of a pun? First of all, there is a pun in verse 20, because right beside each other, there is the word for um, work and the word for useless. And those two words are almost identical. The word for work is ergon, and then you add the alpha in front of it. We call it the alpha privative, right, because it negates something. So you stick a Greek A in front of a word and you negate it. So an atheist is somebody who believes in God not, right? Or a, a person who lives an amoral life is somebody who lives a moral life not, and so forth. And so when you stick an A in front of ergon, well, then it becomes uh, not work. Now, the pun then would be, it's kind of hard to, to, to capture this in English because you have the word work and useless, which don't sound the same, but in Greek they look the same, right? And so one way to capture that might be, a faith without works does not work. Now it's important not only to see that there is a pun in the text, but you should ask the so what question. Why? What, what does the speaker gain by engaging in a pun? Well, well, two things. One, generally, the speaker engenders a, a more favorable response from the audience, right? Because when you hear a pun, you kind of smile and you say, oh, that's clever or cute, and you're more disposed to like the speaker and accept what the speaker is saying. So that's a more general response. But actually, what it does more importantly is it draws attention to the word that you're punning. Right? So in this example, it forces you to slow down and say, wait a minute, toad over there. Oh yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. Toad can mean not only a frog, but it can also mean the past tense of something. So it forces you to pay attention to a word or a term. And so what it does here in James' text is it draws attention that, well, faith without works is workless, right? Or useless as it's translated. But it draws attention on the point that James is making that lies behind the pun. Verse 21 is uh, another example, but from a different perspective of what we had at the beginning at verse 14. Remember we said earlier that there are three ways to ask a question in Greek. A neutral way, in which you don't know what the answer is, or in a rhetorical way. And there are two forms of the rhetorical question. Either you expect clearly the answer no, or you expect clearly the answer yes. In 14 at the beginning, the Greek says there that the answer is no. Can such faith save him? The answer is no. But here in 21, we have a question that expects the answer yes. This is the question about Abraham. And, and was he justified when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? And the Greek text is quite clear. He says, yes, he was. Now, I emphasized this when I read the text, but I wonder if you caught it even then. And that is, we read in verse 22, that is, actions, plural. Now, that's important because uh, what that suggests is that James has in view, when he cites Abraham, not just the one act, right, the one work, the one deed, when Abraham offered his son Isaac on the altar, but his deeds or works, plural. So those things that were evident throughout his life. And the other interesting thing about this verb in verse 22 is that instead of the normal aorist past tense, his actions worked with his faith. Instead, we have the rarer imperfect tense, which highlights the ongoing or continuous nature of the action. And a better way to capture that is his faith and actions were working together. And so these two points, the idea that it's not just one work, but works, and the idea of the ongoing nature of the verb, we're working, that's an important point that the English can't tell you. In other words, James is suggesting to his hearers that it's not just the one-time act of Abraham offering Isaac on the altar that I'm talking about, but throughout Abraham's life, his works, plural, were always in an ongoing, continuous way working with his faith. Word order is also important. 
So in English, we normally have the subject at the beginning of the sentence, we have the verb, then we have the object, and then we have these prepositional phrases at the end. But word order doesn't matter so much in Greek. Well, it matters, but you can be flexible in word order, and you can put things that in English would belong at the end of the sentence, you can put them at the front of a sentence. Why would you do that? For emphasis. And so, for instance, in verse 24, uh, the Greek or word order would be, you see that out of works is justified a person. Now, in our English Bible, that's bad English. We would say in English, you see that a person is justified out of works, right? Just the opposite. But the Greek has put the phrase out of works at the beginning, all right? Before the verb, in the front of the sentence. Why? Because James is highlighting the, the crucial nature works by the way, plural again, of Abraham, and how that gave evidence of his true or genuine or saving faith. In verse 25, we have yet another question. Uh, this is the same point we had earlier with Abraham. And so when James gets to another example, another Old Testament illustration of what true or genuine saving faith is, he has the example of Rahab. And again, he doesn't ask a neutral question. It might look like that in English. Was Rahab justified when she offered up, uh, when she received the spies and sent off the, um, the, uh, the uh, pursuers in a different direction? And James is clear about that. He says, yes, she was. Well, friends, um, let's take a break here, but you can see in this passage then a number of examples, a number of ways in which the Greek tells us things that the English does not. Now, there's a lot more, of course, to interpretation, but uh, one important way of rightly reading the Bible is to approach it grammatically. And uh, we've seen in this passage a number of important ways in which the Greek text has already uh, made some uh, helpful points as we seek to understand what God was saying to James or through James to his original audience and what God is saying to us. So when we come back we'll turn to our next principle of Reformed hermeneutics. We'll approach the text from a literary point of view.